Good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome back to the PCJ speaker series. Um, the Puente Human Rights Movement has a lot in common with the Anti-Police Terror Project, um, from whom we heard a lot about, about which we heard a lot uh, a few weeks back, about a month back. Um, it offers extensive assistance to families Im uh, impacted by police violence while also advocating for the abolition of police. Today, we're really lucky to have with us Phoenix City um, Council Member Carlos Garcia. Carlos is a former executive director of the Puente Human Rights Movement. And he's here to discuss Puente's work, as well as the strategies that community members have taken to achieve community safety without a heavy reliance on police. Carlos Garcia, now again, a city council member in Phoenix um, and former director of, of Puente, was born in Cananea, Sonora, Mexico, um, and he migrated to Arizona at the age of five, where he was raised by his mother and grandfather. Carlos co-founded One Arizona, a nonprofit coalition focused on civic engagement. He was a key player in defeating the former Maricopa County Sheriff Joe Arpaio and in challenging the notorious racial profiling law SB 1070, which I hope we'll get a chance to talk about um, in, in detail um, in our conversation. His work stands on the belief that diverse people with common struggles and vision have the power to change the course of history. So. Uh, Carlos has asked that we have a conversation today, which we will, I, I'm looking forward to doing, doing as is typical. I, he and I will converse for about a half an hour or so, and then I'm going to hand it off to my uh, co-organizer, Christopher Winship, who will also ask a series of questions before we open it up to our community. Um, as soon as you have questions, don't hesitate to put it in the chat. That is going to determine who uh, we call on in what order. Um, and I welcome um, your participation in that part of the event. Uh, so Carlos, welcome uh, so much to the, the, the Harvard Kennedy Schools uh, Program and Criminal Justice Speaker Series. It's wonderful to have you. Thank you so much for inviting me. So let me start by asking you about the Puente Human Rights Movement itself. Um, uh, and can you describe what it is and then also share with us the, the local context within which this movement was formed? Sure, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to speak with you all. Um, I'll start with a little bit about myself, sorry, um, before, because I think it, it, it goes directly into why we formed Fuente and what happened. Um, so before myself, we got to remember Arizona was, was is and will always be indigenous land. It was colonized by Mexico first, the US later, became part of the South for a while. And so meaning slavery was happened here in Arizona. And so this land is a land that's, that's gone through a lot uh, when it comes to colonization, when it comes to struggles and a lot of suffering, bloodshed and so on. So there's a lot of trauma in this land. And I think people often think of Arizona and think of what of golf courses and, and retired white people and forget that a lot of us and our families have been here for a long time. Um, having said that, I grew up about 30 minutes south or I was born about 30 minutes south of the border, um, come from, from Yaqui peoples, which is the native folks from that area. Um, so the, the whole, we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us, applied to my family, applies to a lot of the communities here. Um, and. and when um, I actually come from that mining town, which is uh, my grandparents, my maternal grandfather worked 45 years in the mine and my paternal grandfather worked 35 years in the mine. And I say that because they were involved in union organizing, they were involved in a lot of community work, even you know when we were in Mexico. Um, because of NAFTA, because of a lot of things that, that have happened also in this area, that have impacted this area, jobs were lost and we ended up in the U.S. I ended up, um, my mother and myself, and I grew up undocumented here. I was fortunate enough to obtain my documents, but I always held that as a responsibility because so many of my uh, community and my family were still undocumented. I've had six people in my family go through deportation proceedings, five of them which were deported, uh, other one which we were able to keep here. So it's something that is very personal to myself. Um, Having said all that, um, there's also a lot of movement work, organizing work that happened here in the 60s and 70s. Um, Cesar Chavez, 
was born and died in Arizona. Um, there's organizations called Chicanos por la Causa. There's organizations that were born out of struggle in the 60s and 70s that for whatever reason weren't present at the time of this last onslaught. And so now talking to the context of the need for Puente and the work that we've done in Arizona, we've had about 25 years of a, a constant barrage and attack. And I'll go through it really quickly. Um, following NAFTA, Arizona, we had uh, Operation Gatekeeper, which essentially closed off Texas, uh, California, New Mexico, the traditional ports in which people would cross and created a funnel into Arizona. And so we had the majority of people migrating to the US were coming through Arizona. The other thing that happened over the last 40, 50 years since we invented air conditioning is something I alluded to earlier. A lot of people retiring in Arizona. There is this haven concept of your, it's better for your health because it's a dry heat, the weather is nice for you around. And so you had hundreds of thousands of people migrate here. And so I say that to say that the last 30 years of an attempt to get rid of my community is because these two communities were clashing. You have Midwest, East Coast, people have never seen people like myself move here and think they were coming to, again, a retirement haven, a place that they were gonna be able to do whatever they wanted. And then they quickly realized there's people like myself here. And so 96, that happens, Arizona takes away driver's license. After 9-11, um, we saw the border be impacted just like a lot of places were impacted. Arizona does an English only law. So essentially, um, when I was in elementary school, my teachers could speak to me in Spanish. After this law in 2000, no one could be spoken to another, any other language but English, making it that an entire generation of youth are growing up without being able to have even conversations with their parents or grandparents. 2004, we had a uh, Proposition 200, which took away uh, social services from undocumented people. Um, meaning till this day and from 2004, we have about three or four people deported from hospitals. Um, so because you are undocumented, you don't qualify for health state access. Um, so then you're getting, getting deported, obviously Head Start programs, any other social services, undocumented people don't qualify for them. 2006, we have, uh, uh, two bills passed, in-state tuition is taken away from undocumented folks, but also something that, you know, to this theme of criminal justice, the first law of its kind, it's now removed, but for 10 years we had a law where if you were undocumented, you were presumed guilty until proven innocent. There, you would not qualify for bail if you were an undocumented person in this state. In 2007, we have Sheriff Arpaio. Um, who was already doing, uh, you know, already had chain gangs, already feeding people twice a day, already doing a lot of horrible uh, human rights violations within its, uh, the criminal justice system. But that year he decided to come after undocumented folks by obtaining uh, what we, the 287G program, basically ICE powers to be able uh, to detain and deport people himself. We talked about SB 1070, which basically legalized and forced every police department to act as what Arpaio was doing. So when I say what Arpaio was doing, I'll quickly say he was doing two types of raids. One, where he was going into work sites. We've seen these across the country. He did over 100 of these, did at public libraries, McDonald's, so on. The other thing that was what I think caught national attention was he was doing uh, community suppression sweeps. He would get 200 of his deputies, 100 deputized uh, uh, volunteers. You could imagine who those folks were. And they would inundate a predominantly immigrant Latino Chicano neighborhood and stop and detain anyone that looked undocumented. Rampant racial profiling, all those sorts of things. He did about 15 of those. He would announce them. He would have media. He would have tanks, horses, and just go and terrorize entire communities. I say all those things, and I know I took up a little bit more than I thought, but I wanted to make clear that there was a strategy to get rid of us that Puente had to respond to. And why I say that is when, when uh, presidential candidate Romney actually repeated in one of his debates where he told the world, Arizona's actually figured this out. 
they figured out a way to get rid of people. And it was twofold. It was uh, by attrition. So all these laws I spoke about and some that I left out, literally attempting to make our lives so miserable that we would self deport, um, which it worked, a lot of people left. And the other was to expand the already criminal and immigration uh, dragnet um, to all police, to anyone and everyone, including volunteers and community folks to essentially um, snitch on each other um, and be able to detain, incarcerate and deport people. And so that's the context in which uh, Puente came about in direct response to the immigration and criminal justice system coming together in 2007. And so in our response, we also look at the attrition strategy and kind of the dragnet and, and policies that are impacting us in our organizational structure. And so we've done uh, our organizing models based on an open hand and a closed hand. With the open hand, it's always been to um, counter the attrition. How do we build community? How do we support each other? How do we survive without the systems or in spite of the systems attempting to get rid of us? And then the fist, how do we fight back? And that also takes different uh, or took different uh, strategies, right? From hitting the streets, civil disobedience, um, you know, getting 200,000 people to protest, all those sorts of things, to legal strategies to sue, uh, electoral strategies, and so on. Um, and so that's that's kind of what we've, how we got formed and why we got formed. And then there's a lot of things in which we've dismantled those things. Our Pio spent 10 years of my life waking up every day until we got rid of them. Um, unfortunately, we haven't been able to get rid of everything he put into place, but I think that's the work we're moving into now. Um, so I don't know, I, I think I went a little longer than I thought, but I wanted to set that context. Carlos, not long enough. Um, so I'm gonna ask you to, to, to dig a bit deeper, to, um, share a bit more. You described um, the ways that you, with the open hand, sought to create a sense, a stronger sense of community, support community members, and then with the other hand, fight back. Um, and you, I think you, you did kind of list the ways that you fought back: civil disobedience, uh, suing, etc. But I'd like to hear a bit more about the the work done to create a sense of community, so people knew that they were connected and they could rely on each other, and what that support looked like. Can you both describe what the goals were there, but also how you were how you executed? What, what did you do? exactly to bring this about so that people can say we are now one to the extent that they do. A lot of it was rooted and based on, on, on indigeneity with, with two, two purposes. One, because even in... Hey, in Lamar, which meeting is this I'm in? This is... Okay. So rooted in, in the indigeneity for, for a couple of reasons. One, to understand uh, the development of the systems that were oppressing us, including borders and policing and those sorts of things. Um, so it was important to mark that it hasn't always been this way. And also the second point, which is we are people of this continent. Many of the people that were migrated or being impacted by these policies were actually indigenous people who were being pushed or pulled because of economic reasons or because of the creation of borders and so on. Um, so I say that to say that culture played a huge importance in everything we did in kind of a certain, in, in when you have an entire state, characters like Arpaio, John Brewer, Russell Pierce, literally trying to dehumanize you, our priority is, is for our was for our folks to, to understand that that wasn't the case, right? That, that, that there is, value and, and and so it started at that essential level um pragmatically how it worked um very quickly we learned we weren't going to be able to help everybody there was moments where there was a thousand to two thousand people deported every day from arizona so regardless of how big we grew we weren't going to be able to support everyone so one of the first programs we implemented was a defense course um and the creation of barrio defense committees, neighborhood defense committees. Um, this defense course was a six week course. And the thought was, can we download 
as much as we can for folks of a defense course of, of the things that they can do to protect themselves um even if we weren't around or we weren't able to get there so it started with political education right that was the first thing understand how and why these things are happening to you um that it's not your fault that it's actually a systematic uh, attempt to get rid of you that was kind of week one week two was understanding of your rights understand your rights understand um you know what you can and cannot do and what's going to happen if you have interaction with police or immigration number three was actually the the defense part the preparing yourself we actually had every person have put all whatever they would need in case they needed to, to defend themselves in a court case or so on and we had them create their own protection plan and things that other folks might not think of like who's gonna you know take care so, some folks would sign their deportations because they had a pet that was alone in their home and all they wanted to do is get back to mexico so that they can call someone to go make sure that that pet didn't die even their plants it sounds simple but it's it's things that people were going to have to struggle with as they were in in courtrooms or detained or, or locked up um two more essential things who's going to pick up your kids from school who's how does someone have access to your bank account to make sure you don't lose everything the entire plan of what will happen if you get detained that was week three basically getting the individual person ready to have everything at their disposal or be ready to call from jail and say go to so and so in this drawer i have everything you need to get me out um the fourth one was actual plan the fourth course was how to get out how to how to start <clears throat> formulating a strategy to get out right even if we weren't there apply pressure here do these sorts of things more of the community organizing piece and and you know the last two courses was how to get involved in the community how to get involved obviously with puente or how to build your own defense network to support each other and then at the the last course we would actually have attorneys come sit down and review everyone's case literally sit down and say you entered the country this time you have this misdemeanor you have this is how you would fight it and so we would basically get attorneys to come in and give everyone an argument of what they would fight when they got in, into that situation again all this was yes to have people be ready but it was more of an empowerment tool um once that happened not all joined but those that joined we would then obviously implement the other strategies, whether it was taking on Sheriff Arpaio, doing this lawsuit, doing these actions or so on. But that allow us to kind of bring people into the organization. But even those that didn't come into the organization would still have tools that they would need in case, you know, we weren't around. So was this movement, um, Carlos, primarily in Maricopa County? Are we talking about Arizona, uh, like statewide? And then what does this mean in terms of the kind of core members of the movement? How many are we talking about? Where are they coming from? Um, what, what brought them um, to uh, a place where they were so deeply engaged with the movement? I, so primarily it was in Maricopa County. We would engage outside of here, but I think because of our PIO, because of the intensity of Maricopa County, we, we stuck to Maricopa County at our height. Um, and we still have some members that are hardcore from them, but at our height, we had about 35 defense committees across Maricopa County, ranging in membership. Some were smaller, 25 to 30. Some had a couple hundred people in them. Um, so it did reach of actual member organized people, um, over a thousand folks. But then at moments of, of wanting to, you know, do rally, like I said earlier, we've had marches upwards of 200,000 people or direct actions or so on. So those, there were still allies and others, but the, the member, core membership was um, those defense committees. Um, and and we, do, we did have relationships with folks in other places of the state, and we would do things like that defense course, um, try to go up north to Prescott, flags out to smaller northern cities or down south near the border to try to Kind of share what we were doing with with other folks as well. So it it um, it 
it sounds like the, the authorities in Arizona were ramping up in terms of the kinds of rights that, that were being stripped away from uh, immigrants, um, Latinos, um, undocumented folks um, in, in and around Maricopa County. Um, Puente comes into existence in 2007, um, grows, it sounds like, um, uh, at, a, at a really nice pace in an attempt to fight back. 2010 comes around and uh, Arizona SB 1070, sorry, um, comes into existence. This is uh, reputed to be one of the harshest immigration um, um, laws ever, anti-immigration laws ever passed. It was called Support Our Law Enforcement and Safe Neighborhoods. There are uh, four provisions that were deeply troubling and, um, and they actually probably were more than that, but this is what the, in, this, the federal government um, decided to fight against or uh, put an injunction on. One of the provisions was that being in the state uh, uh, without legal permission was a crime. Um, the second provision, pr provision was that it was a state crime to work in the state without legal permission. The third was that you had to verify your legal status, so show some evidence that you, uh, you were um, um, a legal resident, resident or you would be arrested or detained. And the third was that you could be arrested without a warrant um, based on probable cause or unlawful presence, presumably if they just thought you were an undocumented person. Um, now, eventually three of these four uh, get essentially overturned and injunction is upheld. But I'm wondering about uh, what impact this set of laws had on um, the undocumented community uh, in in Arizona. So the author of this bill, Russell Pierce, I mentioned them earlier. Um, two years later, he would be recalled and removed by by movement work. Um, but his, he's the one in the beginning in the preamble of that uh, law that you referred to. It literally speaks of the attrition strategy. It literally says we are trying to get rid of these pe people. From those that you talked about that were enjoined, the three parts that were enjoined were actually enjoined because those are the, the pieces of the law that could impact citizens, right? The 2B portion that moved forward was the racial profiling piece, was the piece that basically what I spoke of our Arpaio doing. And, I'll, and just to kind of go backwards a little bit, I told this story recently and I'd forgotten about it. But when our pilot was doing his raids in 2008, um, we would be doing cop watch. So we would go out there and, and videotape what was happening, trying to support the families and figure out how we could be uh, helpful. And I'll tell this story just so you could kind of see the mindset of the officers. Um, there was one particular case that we, ca we caught video and there was two young kids that were put to the side because they were waiting for an aunt to pick them up. The mom was gonna be taken. And the sheriff's deputy went into their trunk and they got a couple of toys and gave them to the kids. At the moment, you're like, well, I guess that's nice. He's giving them some toys. But later understanding the psyche that that sheriff's deputy actually knew that part of their tool belt that day had to be toys because their job was going to be to maybe separate a family. And so that's what was happening while our pie was doing. When this piece of law comes in, it basically forces every other jurisdiction, police jurisdiction in the state and mandates them under the threat of even local individual citizens suing them that they have to do that thing that our pie was doing. Um, so that's, that's one piece of that law. So you can imagine, yes, there was fear, people left. And when I spoke of those six, six people in my family getting caught, four of them got caught in that span when 1070 went into, in, into effect. <clears throat> you also spoke of the DOJ suing the state and that was the reason some of those pieces got out. What we were also fighting um, was the contradiction of the DOJ suing the state for this law and DHS on the other hand continuing to work with Arpaio and the rest of the jurisdictions to deport people. Right, because th those folks couldn't drive them directly to the border and just drop them off. So you literally had administration, the Department of Homeland Security, and the Department of Justice 
who were on opposite sides. The Department of Justice was trying to sue to stop this law because it was racist. Um, you had, you know, then President Obama and the, the DOJ lead say that, but then the Department of Homeland Security continued to work and, and helped implement and filled the, the detention centers. Um, so, so it was confusing times. It was confusing times when it comes to, and I mentioned that because then in the strategy to fight back, it also became, Arizona got, was caught centrally in the debate for immigration reform um, because kind of the DOJ side, and I'll, just to simplify it, but the, the, the sector of the Democratic Party or the administration that wanted immigration reform was saying, poor Arizonans, if we don't do something about immigration reform, this law is gonna devastate them. The Department of Homeland Security side was saying, we need to toughen up on the border. We need to give up on all these things in order to come to this compromise to get immigration reform. We're having that exact conversation in these last couple of months. And so we get caught in between this where you have an administration wanting to seem sympathetic and try to push for some sort of immigration reform, but wanting to have the right or the Republican Party or center of the Democratic Party be feel the, I guess, the safety of border expansion, um, more enforcement and so on. Um, unfortunately, what happened is 1070 became, you know, the, the immigration reform part never came and 1070 became the way things were. And so we saw 25 other states following 2010 follow suit, Georgia um, having, I think it was 87, their, 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 their law there, and a bunch of other states in the South implement very similar laws. Um, and, and so two things I wanna say with all those laws and SB 1070 is, is, is that were evident is one, as we were finding the ne next worst thing, which 1070 ended up being the worst, everything else that I spoke of, driver's license, social service, and so on, became normalized and became things that people wouldn't think to fight back on because we were trying to fight the worst thing. Um, but the other thing was, as, as I said with the example of Romney, or as I said with the example of copycat laws, is that we were essentially a petri dish and folks were looking to Arizona for the next draconian law or anti-immigrant or criminalizing law to push in other places. Um, so we'll, we'll, we're going to pick up on that a bit, um, a bit more later um, in our conversation. Right now, I wanted to ask about the, the, the kind of vast array of issues that Wente deals with. Um, it's not just immigration, um, although that is a major concern. It's also about criminal justice, it's about policing, women's rights, children's and youth rights, um, and more. <laughs> it, it's, you, you're managing a lot of issues. And of course, there's a huge intersection with a lot of these issues. Um, but I um, f find that the reach very impressive. I want to focus though on your focus on, or Puente's focus on criminal justice and policing. Can you share exactly what it is that Puente does? Um, especially with regards to these issues so we can better understand and, and how it does it. Sure. I, I don't know if we defined it early on in 2007 when we were fighting Sheriff Arpaio as necessarily criminal justice or, or police advocacy or reform or abolition, um, but that's exactly what we were doing. We were actually, without knowing, you know, these two things had merged and that's what we were fighting for. Um, but very quickly, and and had a staff meeting yesterday. Noemi was telling a story. Noemi is now the person who takes does our casework at Puente. She was one of she was in 2011 detained in one of our piles raids, and because of the lie I spoke earlier, she couldn't post bond. She, at the time, 22 years old, was working as a cashier in a supermarket. She had been there for three weeks. A raid happens. She gets taken in. She gets charged with felonies of taking identity of another, so on, whatever the raids were, were doing. And she had to do nine months in county jail, waiting for that to be resolved. Um, and it's not like she was in 
you know, she was around everybody else who was in jail. She was there for a certain reason. She couldn't post bail, whatever. She created relationships. She, you know, was trying to support people in there. She finally gets her criminal case, you know, done with. Um, and then she goes into a detention center for a year. And so we created more relationship. We figured those things out. But I say that to say that Noemi is not going to ever forget the six months she's or eight months she spent in county jail, the relationships she built there, um, the fact that she couldn't post bail, um, whether she was brought in um, because of this literal criminalization, little vacuum that was created by Arpaio and those forces that were there, or if she had been criminalized or brought in for another reason, she ended up in the same place. And so even if we wanted to just work on immigration, it was impossible to just work on immigration. Um, also, as myself, growing up undocumented, growing up in South Tucson, um, I was in probation the majority of, of my, my teenage life. Again, growing up in the same neighborhoods that a lot of our folks grow in, um, we're not detached. And a lot of undocumented folks, a lot of immigrants end up living in communities that are over-policed, over-criminalized, and know and understand what it was like growing up there. And, and so we've actually, it's interesting because as these conversations for immigration are happening, we're actually oddly not left out, but actually pulling ourselves back a little bit because there is, there is things that we've learned or where the work has taken us that is no longer just about getting documents for some folks, but again, from the beginning of really attacking the systems that are coming after us, which usually have the same characters that are pushing them. All that to say, a lot of our work now, this last year during COVID was to bring attention um, and be at every prison possible to support families and try to support people who are detained or who are in, incarcerated during COVID, um, restoration of rights. Um, we've helped over the last couple of years, folks um, who are uh, tried as adult, you know, had life sentences, had another person on our staff, Vero, who got out last year. She was charged with murder as a 16 year old and did 27 years in prison. She's now out, she's the one She's our lead organizer when it comes to CJ work. Um, and so the work um, has evolved into that, um, but I still don't see it, even though we didn't know what we were doing in 2007, I still see it as part of CJ work now that we can, can reflect on it. Could we have had better lenses? Would we have had better mentorship, had a better relationship, particularly with the black community? If we would have acknowledged those things early on and, and been further along, absolutely. But I think having realized that in the last couple of years, we've been able to take the work to, to a different place. Um, so this isn't on my list, but what does that look like? These collaborations, um, it's easy to see kind of par obvious parallels. So what does the collaboration look like and what specific kinds of criminal justice reform measures are you pushing for? Policing reform measures might you be pushing for? for? So, for example, the the group we brought together of youth um, to fight against our Pio in 2016, which is the year that he finally got pushed out. Um, we sat down that group of youth that had done uh, school walkouts and so on. Um, and there were a lot of them were children of the Puente members or new folks that have come in to, to take on our Pio. Um, and, and it was unlike our adult membership, it was actually black, brown. It looked different than our adult, which was mostly immigrant folks at the time. Um, and the campaign we decided to take on was to get police out of the schools. Um, had some immigration context, but it obviously, now a lot of those same folks or members we were pushing for not to be deported by Arpaio had uh, teenage young adult um, children who made, had their documents, but were now being impacted by things not that weren't just immigration. Their parents were as well, but this was a lot more direct. And so last year we were successful after a three and a half year campaign or four year, four and a half year campaign 
uh, to get Phoenix Union High School District, which is the largest high school district in, in Arizona, one of the largest in the country, to kick the SROs, the, the school resource officers, off of um, the campuses. That's, that's one example of, for example, three and a half, four and a half year campaign that we embarked on, built relationship with, and were able to, um, luckily, I don't say luckily, but you know, the, because of the times we're able to actually accomplish this when we thought it might take us 10, 15 years to do so. And that's one example. I think definitely in the work that's more, I guess at a different scale in supporting folks to, especially the lifers, um, it's been one one of the, the cases we worked on um, that, you know, taking our, our our members or, you know, longtime members or younger members and so on to be able to be at a, what is essentially a, we don't have parole here, but it's essentially a parole hearing um, and having sit, sitting through um, the, the victim's family's testimony, Tarsha's family who we were supporting and, and what they've been through after, I think she did 28 years in prison. That to me, better than theory, I guess, symbolizes how we've been able to integrate the work is actually having, you know, folks come to bat for each other in those situations, in those hearings, in that work. I don't know if that, you know, there's other campaigns, other reports we put out, but to me, like those moments of actually doing the work together, whether it was getting the police out or, or getting individuals out of prison, more symbolize how we've been able to in interconnect that work. Okay. Um, because I can't hoard time, our time with you, I'm just going to ask one more question before handing it off to my um, co-organizer. Um, and that is about uh, the recent pushback from lawmakers um, in Arizona against peaceful protesting, pre peaceful protesters, especially those who are protesting against police brutality, mm -hmm. specifically House Bill um, 2309 would make it a felony if a person acting with seven or more people caused injury or property damage while engaging in a riot or an unlawful assembly. Um, we're told that the legislation appears designed to both convince people to stay away from these kinds of protests, but also to stop people um, potentially from even reporting um, the brutality that they experience. Um, we see we've seen a similar law being passed in Kentucky. I suspect that this is just uh, the first few of many to come in Republican led states. Um, this seems to be a very clear attack on individual civil civil liberties. What does Puente um, do in response to such attacks? Please share, if you don't mind, um, with our community, what organizing looks like in instances like this? Yeah, I mean, I think one thing that's important that I didn't bring up earlier, when the anti-immigrant onslaught came on in 2007 and we had to start founding, we had to found Puente and do all this work, there's, there's something key that happened that year, which is that it was the first year that more non-white babies were born than babies of color. And, and I point that out to say that I think all the, obviously the 107, the Arpaio, everything that led to that was a defense of, of, of whiteness. It was a defense of the hold that they had on this state. Now, we've been successfully able to build capacity, whether it be through organizing or pushback, recalled people, got Arpaio out and so on. Um, and so, I, I see this in a similar way. I, I, I see this, you know, now I speak to you th as the same person that did all those things and what did civil disobedience, was arrested 12 times. I've been charged with two felonies myself for, for doing those direct actions on the council of the fifth largest city in the country. I think folks are seeing that as well. They're seeing that, that, that things are moving. Um, and so I do think that a lot of, of these, where it seems like they're going too far and it doesn't make sense, is that pushback or they're seeing that they're seeing that times are shifting a little bit now i don't want to say that things are fixed because i do think there there's a danger i don't know how to say corporate center democrats whatever 
people call them different things in different places, but there are folks that are going to shift as they see maybe the majority blue is growing than the red. And, and I feel like that's the danger zone. And so I see a lot of those folks um, kind of going along with some of this anti-protest stuff or, or figuring out ways for them to be kind of the new power brokers instead of allowing um, what we see as the dismantling of all those laws I spoke of and, and everything that has hurt us before. Um, and so I, I don't, it doesn't seem like they're gonna pass those laws. I think organizing, obviously this year in the pandemic looks very different, not pandemic. I think, you know, you'd see hundreds, maybe thousands of people there. Um, you'd see people engaged in a different way. So I do think there's, there's, there's shifting. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I think the, it sounds like they're not gonna pass. That's, that's one thing, but I do see them as an attempt to uh, kill momentum or shift things or neutralize folks um, and, and making those that are fighting for abolishing these laws, defunding police and so on, uh, the enemy. And, and in the same way they dehumanize the immigrants, there's an attempt to dehumanize anyone that dares to speak against the police or the systems that are oppressing us. That's what I was trying to round back to. You, you did a great job, um, Carlos. I'm going to ask uh, my collaborator, Christopher, if he would like to ask you any questions. Uh, Carlos, thank you so much for sharing your story. Really quite moving, to say the least. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the Phoenix Police Department these days and whether it's changed or obviously they're a key component of a lot of these stories and horrific stories you're telling us? Yeah, that's a, that's a whole other kind of, again, I, I think Arpaio had a great influence. Uh, the police union had a, a relationship to Arpaio. Frozen. Okay, I'm back now. Okay. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I'm hoping that's not the Homeland Security intervening. <laughs> yeah. So I think I left off here. Um, the mo the moment this one of the moments of deciding to run for office was when President Trump came came to Maricopa County to pardon Sheriff Arpaio. So he shows up, basically, I would say, spitting in our face. After so many years, Arpaio actually got caught up for contempt of court. I told him stop racial profiling. He kept doing it. He got contempt of court charge. Trump shows up to pardon him in a big rally downtown. We have, to me, one of the most beautiful protests we've ever had, like 10,000 people. We literally themed that protest, you know, our culture will protect us, our culture will overcome this. And we had people dancing in the street, we had a beautiful protest. When Trump's rally ends, um, instead of letting the Trump rally goers just come out, the police decides to attack our crown, our, pro our, our protest very similar to what we've seen across the country the last couple of years, you know, pepper spray, rubber bullets, the flashbangs, tanks in the streets, and they just attack us. People end up in the hospital. Um, a lot of what we saw this last summer. Um, and we went to city council the, the, the following week to demand some action, to demand whatever we were demanding, we took it over. And there was no one on council that, that would take that risk. And so, I say that story because me running for office and now being in front of the Phoenix Police Department where we just, we had some wins in the last week of taking some, some protections they had in their memorandum of understanding with the police union. Um, we set out to run for office in a very unapologetic way um, to, while we, basically the experiment of running, of being able to you know, me be myself and our campaign not back off from 
saying to fund the police or saying that our mission to come here is to hold them accountable. Um, but we, at the time we got elected, were the only, the only ones on the council that hadn't been endorsed by the police union. Um, now there's three of us. Um, and so those, again, they seem small, but those things are shifting. Um, been able to push for a couple of policies in the last year, Office of Accountability and Transparency and the CRB, where I think the only one of the large of the 20 largest cities in the country to not have any sort of a accountability process. Um, we this year moved in the budget to create a, a crisis assistance program, an alternative to policing um, to do the mental health, substance abuse calls. Um, but still, because even though it's a majority Democratic now council, um, we are the only ones willing to say defund the police and we still live under the context of everything I spoke of earlier um, in kind of the Arpaio land. And so even the folks that are my colleagues here um, on city council still have that fear. But having said that, there, there, there have been some good things that, that we've been able to push. Um, but unfortunately, our, our police department, similar to what I said earlier about that resistance of change, has acted out even more in the last year. We've seen the unit that takes, that kind of handles these protests, they were handing out uh, coins um, to each other uh, with Nazi symbolism um, to anyone that would actually strike someone in the protest. So if you were able to hit someone with the pepper spray bottle or so on, they would hand each other coins. Um, we had our mayor get a death threat this year by one of the police officers. Um, and so apart from the usual, which I hate to say usual, but office, officer involved murders, um, you know, abuse cases, we've had rape cases and so on. You've seen them act out in a different way this year, whether it's, it's these coins or those sorts of like being more emboldened um, to, to take a different step. So uh that i guess if you ask an update with how phoenix police is is doing that's how they're doing sounds like there's an enormous amount of work to still be done mm -hmm. could you um talk a little bit more specifically about how phoenix and arizona politics are changing and like who your allies are i mean here the state that voted for biden uh who are these people voting for biden that <laughs> <laughs> weren't there before or were voting differently before <laughs> I, I, it's a, it's a hard question because if I could figure that out, I, I mean, we would we would have done it before, and we would just take that formula in other places. I think it's a lot of shame, confusion. I do think the work, without the work against Arpaio, without the groundwork and the the, the changing of the electorate and and kind of that one arm I didn't talk about. We mentioned one Arizona earlier, but there was a very intentional. When we first started the, the fight against Arpaio, he, his approval ratings were at 80%. So you're talking about a community that included black and brown folks, like, I'm not gonna call people out, but there was some folks that were really excited to be in proximity to Arpaio when he was just feeding people twice a day or having chain gangs, right? There's some people even in our communities that were applauding that or were thinking that that was okay and weren't in solidarity with the folks that were there. Um, I think a lot of that has shifted. I think this overreach, I call it an overreach because we've seen the ability to get rid of Arpaio or Russell Pierce and folks willing to do that. I think what I spoke to earlier, there is a danger of, of, of Christian cinema. I've been getting calls for Kirsten cinema in the last four months of like, how do we get to her? How is she going to vote for, for the $15? How is she going to, you know, the filibuster, so on, so on. She's not going to do that. She's always been the person that she is, which is just the same as Janet Napolitano, right? The type of Democrat that comes from Arizona, I would say, is personified by Janet Napolitano, first governor to put troops on the border, um, went to the administration and took on DHS and assembled a plan to deport more people than any other administration had ever had. Um, 
that's the type of Democrat. Now it is shifting. We are and have been the fastest growing uh, city and county for the last, you know, I, I don't even know how long. So there's a lot of people moving here from other places. And there is a lot of folks here who I hope have seen the error in their ways. And if it's not because they saw our humanity, it's because of the embarrassment of having to go somewhere else and, oh, you're from the racist state or you're from the place of these, these crazy people. Um, having said all that, the party might have shifted, right? We have a new sheriff after Arpaio, Sheriff Penzone. The policies are still there, still yeah. feeding people today. He's still deporting people at the same rates. And so I do think we're at a, at a crux, at a very important crossroads where we need to make sure that dismantling everything I've spoken of today is what elected officials are here to do, to actually shift these policies. And it's not just because you're better than Arpaio or Trump or whatever the, the, the latest racist Republican has been. Um, and so I think there is some allies. I do think there is some shifting. Um, but I think it's important to recognize the people that did the work and organized in response to these attacks were the ones that allowed uh, a cinema or Biden to win the state um, in the last couple of elections. What would you like from the Biden administration? Um, I think that, I mean, like for example, there's still ice in the fourth avenue. They're like literal, like small things that we can demand to processes and policy shifts that, that I think we need. Um, they just appointed the chief of police from Tucson to the head of border patrol. He's, I guess, decent person, um, I think first out uh, gay police chief um, that Arizona's ever had. Um, but he wasn't able to handle, you know, a couple of incidents, you know, his police murdered two people last year and he did not know how to handle it. He wasn't aware or able to work with folks. And so the papers the last two days say, you know, appointed a gay chief of police from a progressive city in Tucson to the head of border patrol. And I think we've gotten a lot of that. And we got a lot of that from the previous administration of placing people because of who they are or kind of their identity and expecting everybody to be placated without an actual shift in policy or the way that things are being done. Um, with, with Puente in the last two weeks, we've had to doubt, deal with the increase of people being released by ICE, all the families that are coming to the border. It was a big story last a couple of years, but it's still happening every day. 100 to 200 people are being dropped off at Border Patrol State at the bus stop um, every day, and ICE just releases them. And so what I would want, expect or one of them is, is humanity, understanding of, of what happened, understanding of he didn't make all the decisions or that administration didn't make all this. This same administration didn't make a lot of decisions that happened during Obama's administration. But what I would want to see is the strategy of wanting to give the right something in exchange for our humanity to stop. Because what happened last time is the right never accepted our humanity, even though they got everything they wanted on the enforcement side. And so at the end of the day, I think at least the shift in that strategy that you have to give the other side something in order to appease them and accept our humanity. And again, that's more on the immigration side. On the criminal justice side, there's probably a whole laundry list of, of things that I would ask for. Um, but yeah, I don't know that, that that was the answer you. Okay, yeah, good luck. Why don't we open it up to uh, the audience, Andrew? 
So while we wait for um, folks to jump into the chat, I have a question about um, getting back to the question of police brutality. So over the, the past year, we've focused a lot of attention on that in part because of the murder of George Floyd and, and frankly, the many murders that have happened since. Um, and it's really kind of placed a spotlight on certain cities that have been you know, known as places where um, black folks get killed a lot by police officers. It, it seems as if Phoenix um, after LA is the city that has, where the police force has killed more Latinos than any other city across the country, again, with the exception of Los Angeles. What um, kinds of, uh, you know, so when we think about addressing police brutality, um, we think in terms of reforms to police that, you know, def defunding police and affecting change with regards to policing, et cetera. What kinds of efforts are afoot um, in Phoenix? Because uh, it, it sounds like policing is on the agenda. It's not quite clear to me exactly what it, um, is um, being proposed in order to address the fact that uh, Phoenix police uh, is is doing lots of harm <laughs> to um, the Latinx community, um, and that 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 needs to address be addressed. So, what is happening on the ground to specifically um, get at that issue? Yeah, I, I think, and we're having conversations with other cities about what is most helpful, right? And, and I think because we are so <clears throat> so stuck on the on the times past. Um, some of the uh, gold water comes from here, right? So there's there's been a, the strategy and development of the state and the city comes of less government and kind of a right-winging theory. Um, and so there's there's lenses that are missing. Right? I guess that's, that's where I, I wanna go. Um, fifth largest city in the country, we don't have a public health office, right? And so as, we're coming in and I'm trying to explain to my colleagues police brutality and how our folks are being murdered and what's happening is a public health issue. There is no context. There is no where to grab onto. And when we're talking about entering to with the crisis assistance program, um, which we were able to hopefully we're pushing through to have a, a, a substantial program this year with the $15 million to start off with um, alternatives to responding in, in crisis, you know, Cahoots and Eugene has been kind of the model we're all following, that type of program. Um, we, we don't have, um, we don't have those lenses or that purpose. So, so what I'm saying is we're having to kind of learn um, how to look at the world differently. Um, and and that, that's part of the work that's happening now. Having said that, those things are moving. Um, our, our Office of Accountability and Transparency, which is uh, the office that we, you know, we'll have a vote next month to get in, I believe is one of the only ones of its kind that will now push for internal, re in we call it PSP, but um, internal affairs for everywhere else, will no longer interview officers by themselves. So this new o office, Office of Accountability and Transparency, will actually place someone, a non-police officer in every internal uh, affairs interview um, that is of, you know, of the cases that we want. Um, like I said, we took some things from, from the police contract this year. Um, mo everything, so before last week, uh, officers' records would get clean after five years, regardless of what they did. Officers were able to um, if they were, you know, suspended, they were able to kind of pay that with uh, vacation time. Um, again, it seemed like simple things, but there was things that were happening here that, that we're, we're trying to take away from that. Um, but I think the most important thing that we got done in the, in the memorandum of understanding was the ability for this new Office of Accountability to conduct their own investigations before Internal Affairs was the only office that can conduct any of these investigations. So those are the, the I guess, the things that are happening. Movement-wise, I think folks are, are, are growing. We're trying to figure out um, this difficult space that 
I think we, with abolitionist hearts and with abolitionist mindsets, what does harm reduction look like in, in a healthy way without taking each other on or taking each other apart? Um, you know, do would I can I sit here and tell you that this office of accountability and the crisis assistance program is gonna be the end all that fixes all this? you know, or that stops these murders or that stops this harm? No, but can I look at another mother? Can I look at another child of someone being murdered and not be able to tell them the, the basic things of like, here's a report of what happened. Here's, you know, how we're gonna investigate this or we're gonna try to do this in, in, in these ways. Um, so again, I, I think we're having great conversations with other jurisdictions across the country of how we could be helpful kind of on the elected official peer network of people that are like-minded. Um, but I think the movement conversation of, of where harm reduction takes us, um, accepting it or not, we're continuing to push for complete defunding and abolishment versus getting some of these smaller wins is a hard conversation. I'm not, and I'm not gonna attempt to say that I've figured that out in, in no way. Um, so that, that's where we're at. Thank you so much for that, Carlos. Um, so Sharon Lowenstein, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, uh, sorry. Um, and I'm also going to show my face. Okay, so thank you. Um, I teach in higher ed, but broadening that lens, just the from an, educate, from an educator's platform. So elementary, middle, high school, and higher ed. I feel like we have a great platform, but I'm not sure how to use it. What would you recommend? How can we as educators promote humanity at, at, at the border? Um, yeah, I mean, that's, I think that there's curriculum, there's videos, there's things that could be seen there. Um, for a long time, we would do tours and it felt weird. It, it was helpful. Um, People would learn a lot. Um, it's hard to speak of humanity at the border with what this last administration has done to it, like in the complete dehumanization and um, the focus of, of the wall, right? Like there, there, there has like, I again, <laughs> with with the Obama administration having to port over two million people and and being in the place where we were at the end of 2016, there, there was this thought like it couldn't get much worse and um, it definitely did, but it did in a sense of the dehumanizing piece, right? The policies, he was able to shift some, he built the wall a little bit more, um, but that disconnection and dehumanizing of those of us that crossed that border to get here, um, even if we were from this continent or not, um, and the, the folks from the rest of the world that end up in Mexico to cross is, is I think the perfect place where you're at to speak to that humanity and, and, and start to rebuild that frame. It seems, it seems like we're going backwards, but I think it's as basic as telling those stories and affirming folks' humanity um, in both how this country was built um, on the backs of, of black, brown, indigenous folks and on the blood of those folks. Um, and having those conversations with elementary, junior high, secondary ed are, are really important. I, I wanna say um, that the first thing I did that, that got me to having now been committed my entire adult life um, to, to fighting for human rights or, or doing the work that I've done was that as an 18 year old, I, I went to the border was given a blowtorch and a piece of plastic um, to patch up a water tank. I didn't understand why I had to do that until I got there and they told me that both Border Patrol and ranchers would shoot holes through the water tanks um, so that people couldn't have water as they're walking or dying through the desert. Um, so to me, that was very impactful, right? We can't, you know, especially for you, wherever you're at, away from the border, I can't replicate that for, for some of your young folks, but figuring out ways to understand um, what's happening, I think is, is what we can do. Um, 
And I see Judy Green out there. Judy Green uh, asked the question. Uh, Judy was one of the first folks to, to come out here when Arpaio was, was around and, and wrote a great paper, uh, Democracy and ICE. I think this was back in 2007, 2008 to kind of, which helped us to begin to tell the story. Uh, some folks call it immigration, but kind of this, this merge between uh, the criminal justice immigration system and how characters like Arpaio were, were enforcing it. So good to see you, Judy. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. So, so Carlos, um, it's been reported that Biden is preparing to nominate um, Tucson Police Chief Chris Magnus to be the commissioner of the US Customs and Border Protection. Um, he's been, Magnus has been a, a major critic of the Trump administration, um, specifically the immigration policies. And um, if approved, he will run the country's largest federal law enforcement agency during a period in which the US is experiencing a huge um, increase in migrants arriving at the Southwest border. Um, how would you assess this nomination in relative and absolute terms? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I touched on it earlier. I, I do not think he handled things in Tucson well. I do think there's, there's decent intentions there. That is one of the bloated, like, if you actually, I, would, I actually went to Nogales this, this last weekend, there's so many people standing around. And, and again, I think it was this, this attempt to appease uh, either folks in the middle and the right to say, the larger the number got of spending at the border, the more safe people felt. And to me, it's, it's the exact same way our policing budgets have been bloated up in the last 40 or 50 years, right? For white people to feel safe, you need to be able to tell them, I'm spending the majority of budget to make sure that black and brown people aren't getting you, so you're gonna be safe. This is what we saw literally in the last 20 years. And so I would hope that they would have that. We've had those conversations with Magnus about how police budgets are, are bloated. Um, I would hope the analysis is to actually do a legitimate study of the need of border patrol and people not just sitting around. If you all would see some of these border force stations, you, you'd lose your mind. They're basically little towns out in the middle of nowhere with hundreds of vehicles just parked there. And it's all, again, this presumed, like we're spending billions to make you safe, but it's actually just wasting it. Um, and so I would hope that what they're doing is an actual analysis of what's what they're dealing with. And like we see with policing, not resulting in, in what they said it meant or what they meant to do that defunding border patrol should be the number one priority like it's there's just that's where you have to start like it's, it's not about policies or how you're taking care of people it's literally how how do you defund what's been created as and again again i wish i show pictures but it, it's literally one of the most wasteful things you'll ever see again because of the militarization of the border that already exists, the drones, the walls, those sorts of things, you now see, um, you know, all the adverse, like the deaths, um, everything else that's happening. And so I would hope again, um, that the beginning of that uh, conversation with the Chief Magnus who knows the border better than, than most, um, to literally look at, at how the funding that department looks like. So Frank, um, would you like to ask your question, Frank Hartman? Good, thank you. You use the word humanity several times. It seems to me as if you shared with us a remarkable story of your own humanity. You know, a human being who has evolved and grown and continued to focus on helping others. It's, I think it's a remarkable story, which I wish more people could hear. You've talked about difficult situations, Arpaio. You've talked about the Phoenix police attacking your protest. I thought I heard you say, which way to go? Uh, and yet you continue, you continue, you continue. What gives you hope? 
Um, I think I said from the beginning, it, it feels more like a responsibility. And it feels, I, I said it throughout my campaign and, and I still have that same feeling. I'm not supposed to be here. I'm not supposed to be a city council. I'm not supposed to have graduated college or high school. <clears throat> Again, I was in juvenile, arrested many times as a teenager. There were so many systems set up. Um, shoot, the, the, if we would have listened to the border, I wouldn't have been, I'm not even supposed to be in this country, right? And so now having a 14 year old, having a four year old, having spent my entire adult life uh, working with the communities that have shown the resilience to survive the level of attack I just spoke with, that that includes my own family, it still feels more of a responsibility and uh, that's the least I could do. Because again, for whatever reasons, I was able to survive those things that were trying to stop me from doing something else. Um, but the hope lies in the resilience of those folks. And in the, the, I spoke about Noemi earlier. She's literally 22 year old, had no idea what's happening in the world. And our pile decided to raid her business, spent almost more than a year and a half in, <clears throat> in different jail cells. And now for the last seven years has been helping other people um, get out. And so I do think there's, there is hope, but there's also this 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 feeling of unfinished business or or resentment of of the folks in my community that that weren't able to make it. That also fuels me, and so I don't want to pretend that there's just this hope that things are gonna get better. There is anger, there is resentment that also fuels me, and not in a negative way. I, I would hope, or, or in a way which I want to um create harm to others because they have harmed us but in a way to to show that they were wrong and to try to attempt to open doors for others not to have to go through the same hurdles or or be stopped um as the ones i went through what you were doing and how you're doing it is remarkable thank you I absolutely agree with Frank. Um, Carlos, thank you so much for joining us and sharing not just your story, but the story of, of Phoenix, of Maricopa County, of Arizona, and frankly, of many communities across the country and may, perhaps especially in the Southwest. Um, I uh, so appreciate having met you and to the little bit that we have gotten to know you. Um, and I do hope that we stay in touch. I am just in, in awe of what you've been able to accomplish um, and I wish you the best. Thank you for.